Coming up on Magical Medical Tour with my co-host, Dr. Glenn Woolman, and special guest, Katie Fox, a Hatha yoga practitioner and instructor. She teaches embodied anatomy and focuses on multiple contemporary movement disciplines. What should you know about yoga before taking a class? Do you know the importance of the connective tissue throughout our body and what we're learning today? This and more are coming up next here on YHTV. This week's episode is brought to you by Support the Mountain's Herbal Parasite Cleanse. This formula targets the small and large intestinal tracts and larvae, the most broad-spectrum formula available today. 100% organic, formulated by Dr. Mikio Sanki, author of the Esoteric Acupuncture Series. For 10% off your first bottle, visit shopyogahub.com and use the coupon code CLEANSE at checkout. Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. Thank you for joining us today uh, for Connective Tissue Order and Disorder. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful co-host and medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. What's up, Doc? <laughs> oh, oh, I was so excited about listening <laughs> to your introduction, I just got overwhelmed. <laughs> As always, <laughs> greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I am Dr. Glenn Wallman, and I will be your medical guide, along with Christina today, as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy in search of optimal health. Today, we're going to be speaking with Katie Fox, a Hatha Yoga instructor. She uh, also practices and teaches embodied uh, movement. And she's done many things out in the public spaces to uh, bring people's awareness to health. So this is going to be kind of an exciting day, some very interesting things. Uh, but before we talk to Katie, how do people get in touch with us, Christina? Well, at any time during the show, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment simply by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into the comment box. Now, this can be... The, a year from now, it can be months from now, don't worry. We will always um, make our best attempt to reach our special guests if, it's, if it is a question or comment for them or Dr. Woolman or myself. We will get back to you. Now, if you're listening to this as a podcast, just give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. Thank you, Glenn. You are welcome, Christina. <laughs> So let's uh, introduce our special guest today, Katie Fox. As I said, she's a Hatha Yoga instructor. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And she has many other creative aspects of her life that she's brought out into the public to help people with their own healing issues. So let's meet Katie Fox. Welcome, Katie. Hey, thanks, Glenn. <laughs> Hello, Hi, Christina. Katie. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> We're so excited. Especially me, me. Too. I'm bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm jealous. <laughs> You're jealous of Christina bouncing? I am. I don't have anything to bounce on. So. <laughs> uh, okay, Christina, you're going to have to bounce for Katie and you. I have to, I have to share my bounces both sides, right? <laughs> That's right. I can tell you, Katie, that if Christina starts bouncing and you see her bouncing, it means that the things you're saying are very exciting and interesting to her. <laughs> I'll take that as a cue. Yeah, so we always challenge our guests, see how fast you can get her bouncing and how high. <laughs> No one has gotten her off the uh, off, the off the ball yet. <laughs> totally. I'll so, see what I can do. Yep, keep going on that. So, as the medical guide, Katie, I like to tell our uh, viewing uh, global audience uh, kind of the path we're going to take today. So, we're going to find out about uh, what interested you in your teachings and how you uh, dealt with your own injuries through these uh, methods that you work on and, and how you've taken it into the public space that I think is very interesting to help other people in healing in many different ways. Is that all right? Yep, sounds great. Excellent. So let's start just with a brief introduction of, of Katie Fox. What took you on your path to healing? Um, I would frame it as a path to learning, actually. Uh, okay. I think often they're one and the same, but 
I had gone to art school. I graduated with a BFA in printmaking and then uh, made my way to San Francisco where I started taking yoga classes um, as a way of um, finding calm, I would say. And I took classes for maybe two years. Uh, I really liked it. I liked what uh, the effects that it was having and I found it really interesting. I also found it um, fairly esoteric at times and I was really curious about what was happening how to understand it more how to affect uh, changes uh, more directly or even indirectly when when necessary and so I and so I sought out a teacher um, and found one in a little bit of a strange way. Someone had uh, recommended that I go take classes with this woman who held classes that were mostly like three people, maybe five. Uh, and she um, she didn't offer to teach me right away, but she said, oh, well, go, here's a program, here's a program. And I looked at different programs um, that did all involve... Uh, philosophy and anatomy and different ways of learning and being certified to teach yoga. Um, but there was something that she was doing that, that felt different enough to me at that time than I didn't understand it. Uh, and so I persisted and finally she took me on as a student just one-on-one -on -one and we worked together for two years. You said, wow. you, you said you took this to make changes. Are you talking about physical, emotional, mental, spiritual changes? Where, where are you with that or all of the above? <laughs> where am I with that? Uh, I think that's, that's a lifelong process. So okay. um, I'm happy to get more, more specific with that. But yeah, I feel like uh, in some ways yoga is a mind practice and the... Essentially, it's, it's slowly being able to understand different kinds of knowledge. And that's one way of defining the mind is through the different ways that the mind um, perceives experience. Um, Do you have so a definition of mind? Mind, uh, I'd say it's different than brain. Uh, in some mm -hmm. ways, I'd just say consciousness, awareness. Um, okay. In yoga philosophy, mind is defined probably... Through the five different fluctuations that it can uh, be moved by, which are correct knowledge, incorrect knowledge, or misapprehension, um, imaginative knowledge, sleep, and memory. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. You know, this is interesting. We're, we're Yoga Hub, and we've had yogis and yoginis on. We've had... We've uh, had uh, like an episode 149 with uh, Chantal Evrard. Mm. She was a yoga instructor, but we've never really talked about yoga. I find that huh. kind of interesting. So how about, yeah. could you give us a, a one to two minute history on yoga? Yeah, I know, I would be very I know that myself. I can do a one to two minute history. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll cover the Tao, Buddhism, and uh, Christianity. <laughs> I was going to say, Glenn, you know, you're, you're asking for a lot, Glenn, because on our other shows, we have done the yoga and it's like, uh, one to two minutes. Mm. Well, I, I always think, ask for a lot. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's good. I think it, for anyone listening who's really interested, then just know that the history is, is complicated, convoluted, and there's a ton of literature out there actually to learn more, um, often not always in agreement with each other. The basic agreement is that yoga probably started about 3000 AD in the Indus Valley civilization. The Indus Valley is um, like present day Pakistan and Northern India and Nepal. There was a very um, civilized uh, civilization there, about 3 million people, um, pretty, uh, pretty well organized as far as drainage is concerned and um, living conditions for regular citizens, like just the way that the towns were built. Um, there, was, there were bathhouses. A lot of the home structures were similar to one another as opposed to other civilizations where there's like a big temple complex and then mud huts kind of all around. Um, they made 
or I think in 1920, some, sometime in the 20s, they did an excavation there and found a bunch of small seals um, that were made of soapstone uh, that, uh, like, thousands of these. And on them were, were people in yoga positions. Um, mm. and, and not just, like, a seated meditation position, but actually, like, a very specific pose. Um, so, so it's believed to have started there. And, and even the fact that it was in seals at that time probably means it started earlier because it was already kind of a revered and practical part of the, um, civilization or the culture. Uh, you kind of fast forward from there. So it's based in India, but it's also, um, it was in Iran. It's, it's in Thailand. It's kind of all over, um, I'd say kind of modern day lineages do go back to southern India for the most part. And there have been a few teachers that um, specifically wanted to bring yoga to the West. And there's been a back and forth between like uh, the states in India and Western Europe and, and Britain also. Um, I don't know how far to get into that. But. All right. Well, let me ask, let me ask some more questions, and we'll get into a lot more things. So you say it's come to the West now, and we we all see a number of things. We hear of Hatha Yoga, and there's Bikram Yoga, and a number of other types of yoga. So people are out there hearing about yoga. How do they know what's the best way to figure out uh, what's the best yoga for each person? Hmm. Um, so most of the yoga classes now that people see are going to be asana based so that's the physical posture practice of yoga um which is just one of kind of eight limbs that all go together um like another is breath work another is concentration another is meditation um and so even the physical practices are quite different from each other um so i'd say it's kind of about what your intention is as far as your intention and knowing and knowing yourself well enough to um, try out different things and see what works best. Um, Bikram is a very it's a set of twenty six poses. It's going to be the same class no matter who you go to, no matter what teacher you take. For the most part, it's also heated, mm-hmm. um, so that's good for some constitutions, and it's um, less appropriate for others. Uh, You'll see vinyasa offered a lot, vinyasa or power yoga or flow classes. Those generally are about moving fairly consistently in and out with the breath, often to music, not always. Um, Hatha, all of these kind of actually do fall under the umbrella of Hatha. But if you see a Hatha class listed, most likely it's going to hold poses for a little bit longer. It may use props. Um, So uh, the nature of all yoga, I think, is to actually come to still the mind. Um, And so the way you do that is there's it's kind of endless, Um, even in some of so yoga was originally taught as an oral tradition, often one-on-one. And then probably, again, it's contested, but I think around 200 BCE, um, the Yoga Sutras of Pantanjali was collected and written down. And then since then, there's been a pretty uh, extensive history of um yoga methods, yoga practice, yoga philosophy, yoga science, um, that can be um, read and, lear- and learned from. Does, does, do the people in India the, feel that the yoga that's practiced in this country is uh, appropriate, right, or that it's just for Americans? Well, first thing is I can't speak for any Indians. Uh, second thing... Come on, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> speak for some Indians. Um, I would say, you know, it's interesting. Again, the postural yoga kind of... There was a, there was a, a reinvigoration of postural yoga in India, probably in the 1920s and 30s. Um, it was tied 
it's, it's, an, it's interesting. It's tied also to like they were they were practicing calisthenics then. Um, they were practicing gymnastics then. Um, so it was part of a cultural kind of revolution in a way, as far as that's um, interwoven with the history of India and British. Uh, yeah. Um, so when I went to India, I studied there. I traveled in South India for six months. And this was about 10 years ago. Um, there were less drop-in yoga classes. It was hard to find. Um, and it was even, it was like people were starting to be like, oh, yeah, I do, I do, I've heard of yoga. I know yoga. And it was, it seemed less, um, certainly less prevalent in everyday uh, practices. And the last time I went to India, there are studios just like here. And it was actually hard to find a class that wasn't flow or wasn't um, kind of centered on the physical. So my take is that there's lots of different ways into yoga. Uh, and the physical practice is certainly one of them and, and is the one that I teach and I study and I practice along with, with other aspects of the philosophy. Um, so when you talk about asana practice in America, there's like some extremely good things being done here. And I'd say actually that that, have, that has been influenced the way that people practice yoga in India in, in really positive ways. There's also the yoga scene um, here yeah. that, is, uh, that is in some ways almost its own thing. Um, and... Um, I don't know what I don't know what Indians think of that. Okay, uh, you know, just to prove my extensive knowledge of of yoga, mm -hmm. uh, what's the what what are you trying to get when you do a downward dog versus a sun salutation? And I know you're uh, totally impressed with that. Very, yeah. Do you want to get? I've got to tell you, I'm really impressed <laughs> with that. <laughs> <laughs> so a downward dog is one specific asana. A sun salutation is, is a sequence of asanas put together in what one would call a vinyasa. Um, so a downward dog, it, each pose you can think of as a blueprint. Um, so you kind of take the blueprint and then depending on how you, where you bring your awareness to, where you put your attention to, how you are able to balance quite literally the tensions in the body, um, and in the mind, different things will happen in that pose. But each pose, again, does have a blueprint to kind of affect certain systems or certain glands or certain mind states. Um, downward dog uh, is generally kind of touted as like a perfect pose. You know, it's that it's that you can learn every pose within downward dog. I actually don't agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. I'd, there are other poses that I think you can do that. The... As far as a sun salutation, it's a good way to learn how to correlate movement with breath. So it's a good way, I think, for beginning students to understand, um, not even understand, but to be in direct relationship with their breath, just in that sense of like all of a sudden they're, they're being asked to pay attention when the inhalation is happening, when the exhalation is happening. And so in some ways, I think that pairing that to a sequenced movement gives them more information. So it's like, okay, well, when is the exhale really ending? That's mm. when you start the next movement. When is the inhalation really starting from? That's when you can start the next movement. And so it's a way of honing the attention. Um, it certainly is a um, pumping action. It, it gets things moving. Um, there's a lot you can say. So what would be, give me three or four questions that a person would ask uh, when they walk into a yoga studio and they're trying to figure out if this is the right one for them. What are some questions that you would ask to determine uh, that it would be a good class for them? Um, I mean, I think in some ways you can go in and just take a class and not ask any questions per se, like just see what the teacher is like, see what the movement is like, see what your reaction to it is like. Um, in that situation, I would suggest not forgetting the things that you know, um, meaning 
often if you go into a class, especially if it's something you've never done before, I think a lot of people anyway are fairly willing to place a lot of trust in the teacher or in the practice, which at a certain point is necessary and I think actually really helpful. But in the beginning, I'd say, you know, go in, you move throughout your day and you generally don't injure yourself. You can go into a class and try new things. You might feel new things, but, um, but each class is going to be so different. So, Glenn, I know I'm, I'm not really answering your question in that. You could see a list of 10 Hatha classes, and you could go in and actually each teacher focuses in such a different way or sequences in such a different way that your experience, you'd walk out, and if you didn't know it was all yoga, you might not say you've done the same sort of thing. Um, and... Uh, I mean, there are questions. I would say if you're, if you're new to yoga, it's really good to go in and more than ask, kind of inform. Say, hey, this is my first yoga class. I'm feeling a little nervous or um, I've had these injuries. Um, another thing is lots of people will give physical adjustments. If you don't want that, then you could say, just so you know, I don't, I don't want a physical adjustment. Or I'd really love a physical adjustment. This is my first time. I don't. I learn more by, you know. Um, touch than by seeing. Um, um, what are other things? Yeah, if there's anything that you want to know, <laughs> ask. Right? No, I think yeah, I think what your your point was actually informing was uh, very good. I like that. But you brought up injuries, and uh, this is one of the uh, the important parts for me. I see a lot of uh, older adults that, you know, get onto the bandwagon and want to do yoga, and they're very excited about it, and by their second or third session, they now have a knee injury or a shoulder injury or something like that. So what kind of things should a person know and should it, they expect from a teacher to help them avoid injuries in a yoga class? Um, I would suggest if... if it's an older person who is um, concerned about that. Pro I mean, one way is to say I would seek out a Hatha class or a restorative class or some sort of slower based class. That's not mm -hmm. um, because if you go into a flow class, a lot of times it's like, oh, I'm just trying to ke keep up before right. you understand what's going on. Um, the other thing is that, again, as an indirect way, you know, you'll see like beginning level classes and and continuing classes and advanced classes. A lot of the times, the real difference in an advanced practitioner versus a beginning practitioner is 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 to what extent you're able to listen to your own body and to um, what kind of practice you've had in becoming more sensitive to lots of different information on the inside. So I'd say for someone who's just starting, that know that that takes a long time. I mean, just just the science of it. You know, we have, the brain has a body map, and the more you do, the more you build build that. Um, you're making connections literally through the synapses of nerves. Through once tissue becomes um, nicely hydrated and um, slippery, you can feel things more. So. Yeah. Um, so know that probably in the beginning you're you're it's almost like you're going into a cooking class with oven mitts on the whole time, right? <laughs> so at first it's like okay, well don't hurt yourself using that knife, and it's like okay, but I, it's harder to use that knife because I can't you know get all the nuances of it. <laughs> knife isn't the best example, but um, no, it's a great example. That's I love it. It's a great it. example. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so there's that. I think. Again, know your intention. Understand that it is a gradual process. Mm -hmm. And um, and also know that, uh, you know, mm, I think a lot of, again, when you're beginning to learn something, especially movement-based in this way, a lot of it does come through mimicking, right? Like, it's like, okay, put your, put your arms out. Okay, I'll put my arms out. Is this the right height? Is this the right height? That's fairly gross level, but it... But if you're working with a teacher and you're mimicking a teacher who has a, de a very developed practice, then then you're you're learning a lot through that initial mimicry. Um, 
as you develop practice and as you as you also develop a relationship with a teacher, I'd say, then you start generating the poses from the inside out. Then it comes through, okay, well, I'm going to set up my grounding, um, but then I'm more concerned about the relationships on the inside, and I don't really care what it looks like on the outside. Often you'll be amazed what you, I mean, I'll tell students, I'm like, gosh, I wish I had a camera right now because it looks so beautiful on the outside, but it's not because they're doing something to impress. Um, I like so that. I, so I think injury comes when when you've obviously haven't been able to read signs that your body is giving you. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and go ahead. I was, you know, I I think in some ways too, it's like if you know you're competitive or you know you're timid, or, you know, I mean, like, what are your basic personality? Uh, traits in some ways, so then, then know that going into a class too, and and you can set some limits for yourself. You know, especially if it's like, okay, I'm not going, I'm going to watch more often, or I'm going to, if they ask me to take really wide stance, take a little bit of a shorter stance. Like you don't, I would say, first few classes, try not to feel anything extreme. Mm-hmm. You'll feel enough. You'll feel enough new just by by positioning yourself in ways that you're not used to moving, that will be enough to inform a change. Now, speaking of injuries, uh, we know you can get injured potentially doing yoga, but people can also get injured not doing yoga. And Mm -hmm. now there's a a lot of scientific research showing that certain types of chronic pain, especially back pain that a lot of people have, uh, can actually, under the practice of yoga, make some improvements. Uh, There's a lot of strong evidence for short-time improvement of pain, and there's some moderate evidence of long-time improvement of pain. So my understanding is that you, you were doing yoga, but you also had some injuries. And how did, how did you work through that with your yoga? Um, so I, I did have an injury to the low back um, through a wakeboarding accident. I, w- I also know that that area was vulnerable anyway for me. Um, but it did. It got to a place where it was, like, very, very painful. I couldn't really do anything. Um, I was, again, lucky to be working with my teacher one-on-one, a, kind of a second time. And, um, and I decided... This is telling a past story. I have different ways of thinking about it now, but I'm going to go through this, the story of it. I decided to stop doing everything that I was doing. And basically, um, we developed together one practice for me to do every day that I did um, every day for about an hour to an hour and a half um, for a good year. And the changes that happened from that were more significant. Um, the changes that happened had to do with restructuring, reorganizing my own, the way that the different parts of myself relate to each other and also to gravity. So, um, so the idea that we are physical beings, you know, nerves and joints, all that stuff is, I hate to use this word, but you know, in this context, stuff that's affected by forces and um, and depending on how the patterns in the body, the pattern in the nervous system, the patterns in the tissue, which can hold um, hold shape, like you can think of how trees over time are affected by the wind. So it's you know it's like the wind moves, the tree branches move, but over years the branches are in a certain direction as well. The body also, the connective tissue takes. Um, repetitive movement over a lifetime and that also guides what's available to you as a movement um, it also guides the forces so um, personally the way that my body was organized there were a lot of tensions and forces going in places that uh, weren't the best places to go um, so the practice that I did again it was um, all stabilized work so it was all grounded um, and 
it was giving it enough time to kind of using a, a basis of like first you first you're able to create a condition to rest then you're able to create a condition to um, just make space in the body then you can find ways to lengthen um, and then you can find ways of stabilizing which means kind of working the different parts in relationship to each other and then come strengthening um, and so for me, that was really enlightening in some ways because it was empowering, in other ways just because it was a huge amount of learning. Um, and that work has continued. With I work with other people now in, in, that, in a similar capacity. Um, and I see it in both ways, right, where it's like, well, the structure of our bodies influences our thoughts and our beliefs and what's possible and what's not possible as all that and also in the reverse um so i don't think it wasn't um the you know herniated disc was not causing my pain and yoga mm -hmm. didn't really heal me <laughs> um, oh, interesting okay i would Very say nice. it was more about um a slow process of of uh, learning and gaining knowledge and kind of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a yoga sutra that says that pain is, um, what is it? Uh, essentially, pain is because of an association of the seer with the seen, and the remedy lies in their disassociation. And so I think a lot of it is, is about that, of saying, okay, well, well, in some ways, yes, what is the root causes of things? And then also, where am I able to direct my energy consciously rather than just being taken for a ride, um, which I think is what pain does a lot of the time. And that's what you're doing through yoga. You're consciously moving things around. You mentioned uh, connective tissue. Uh, and interestingly for me, <clears throat> when I was in medical school and I was uh, doing a surgical Residency, connective tissue was just the stuff that was in the way it's that we had to, uh, that we had to cut aw cut away from to get to an organ or tissue or to a bone or a muscle or something else. Yeah. But a lot of a lot of studies now, and there's some great YouTube videos on mm -hmm. the the new learning of connective tissue and what it does. Why don't you explain that to us about connective tissue and its relationship? Sure. Um, so. The body, almost everything is living in a home of, con of connective tissue. So every, every muscle, every organ, every muscle spindle, every cell is actually contained within this matrix, um, kind of, you can think of it almost as an inner ocean of fascia. Um, fascia is a general word um, for connective tissue. There are lots of different kinds. But the the basic differences between the kinds is what's the chemical makeup, whether, some, whether the tissue is more dense, um, it needs to be more fibrous um, and be stronger, or if it needs to be more fluid and gel-like so that organs can glide against each other, say, versus tendons that need to give direction to forces through bone. Um, it's... What's great is, especially if people should check out these videos online, it's, it's such a different way of visualizing um, what we are. Um, so if you think about anatomy books or if we've seen, you know, a skeletal system or anything, you are looking at drawings of cadavers, right? It's very rare to see uh, living inside. It's usually something not right if that's, if that's happening. Um, Unless and, you're doing a surgery residency, right? Yeah, exactly. So you have a, you have an insight that we that most of us don't have, um, mm -hmm. and that's what's nice about these videos is that they're actually come they come from a surgeon who's doing um, he puts a camera in to living to to, to people who are alive during surgery and and checking out the fascia. It's um, it's. It's a communication system, it's a connective system, and again, it, it can change um, 
its state depending um, through movement and also through immobility. So if we, like the easiest way to think about it is if you, if you break your arm and your arm goes into a cast and then you get out of the cast six, or whatever, six weeks later, and it's like, okay, the bone is healed, but now you have a stiff shoulder and you can't move. And that's because of the fascia hasn't been receiving movement. And, um, and so its inherent quality is actually to kind of shrink and tighten. You can think of it almost like as a saran wrap. But in, in day-to-day life, as you're moving, the fascia gets um, lubricated and, um, yeah, I, I don't know that's, <laughs> where, that's where to good. go with that. Yeah, it, it is fascinating. And what we're, what we're seeing now, especially uh, with uh, Pilates and physical therapists, and others that when you hear words like myofascial release, mm-hmm. uh, that's one of the buzzwords of the day that people are working on to get more movement and to heal different body parts. Uh, right. I also have to say that, you know, the connective tissue has order to it. Uh, and uh, when you see fluids going through it, it, it makes you think that this is even more of a reason that we need to stay hydrated. You know, we always talk about people right. should drink more, but I, I think as we learn more about the connective tissue and the fascia, that may be a focus for where uh, hydration really works rather than just in the stomach and in the blood vessels. It, it's getting into yeah. the, the, the connective yeah. tissue, but also, Definitely. yeah, but also there are many very special dis- disorders of the connective tissue. People have had things like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and these people probably are great in yoga because they have very flexible joints. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then there's other people with Marfan syndrome that have certain looks to them, osteogenesis imperfecta. There are many types, even things like systemic lupus, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, These are all connective tissue disorders, and we're learning more and more about them uh, through genetics and the you know, the work of seeing these videos. So I think this is going to be a whole area of specialization in terms of treatment and healing. And it seems to me that uh, the yoga that you do, and and we're going to get into right now some of the embodied anatomy work that you do and the different disciplines for conditioning. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Um, in some ways, it's, it's one and the same. So Correct. The... The interesting thing, too, like, I think the interesting thing to kind of bridge that to the fascia is that you can, the fascia really is connected all the way from the skin down through the bone. So it's, um, it has a tensegrity aspect to it where if you do this, you're just picking up the skin. If you hold that for long enough, it has an effect all the way through. And so when you, um, when you're doing, certain yoga poses and you do hold for certain amounts of time, the, the organization that comes through that is, um, affects down to a cellular level. There's actually some really interesting research about that where there's kind of timing the different kinds of, of stretches, right? So stretch is not a word that I use or think about that often, um, mostly because of that difference of, of fascia, you know, lots of people think about muscle a lot. And I think it's like, okay, well that leaves out a ton of information again. So I think there's maybe like six or seven times more, um, sensory nerves in fascia than in muscle. So if you think about that throughout the entire body, then again, there's a ton of sensory information that we can actually feel, um, that's being generated, um, that doesn't have to do with how, you know, is a muscle long or, or, or not, or, or not. Um, the, what the research is showing is that as you hold a stretch for longer, the fascia itself doesn't take that long to respond. Um, again, you can just do this, hold it for maybe even, you know, somewhere where you don't usually do it around the ribs and you just pull away for a little bit, hold it for a minute and and let it go. And it's like, oh, things feel uh, more hydrated. But the longer stretches um, or the longer, a better way of thinking about is the longer um, moments of of balanced tension uh, 
actually do affect the, the cells. So like the fibroblasts are one of the major cells in, in the collagen, I believe. And the fibroblasts themselves will change shape after about 10 minutes and, and probably more about 40. Um, so that they're actually the cytoskeleton of the cell reorganizes itself. And part of that reorganization is that it releases ATP um, from the cell to outside of the cell. Um, and that, as far as I understand, again, this is just stuff I've, I've been reading recently, acts as a signifier um, for the immune system. And that will, kind of an easy way of saying is it, is it will decrease inflammation and it actually um, is believed to act as a way to reduce pain. Um, so that's stuff that's, that is real. Like you, you take a movement, you move your body in a certain way, you hold it with attention and awareness um, because that also changes what's able to occur. And then this, what's happening on a cellular level is affected. Um, so the work that I do with embodied anatomy um, in some ways, again, it's just teaching people ways to uh, locate sensation inside uh, because it's like if you use anatomy, it's, it's a good map, right? It's like, okay, well, you know there's a bone here. We can look at the shape of that bone. Your bone is slightly different. Everyone's bones are slightly different, but the general is there. It's, once people kind of get that and can feel it on the inside, um, the the consciousness around that and then again the the series of relationships that can develop within the body um and within the mind uh changes what you said you mentioned intention and awareness what mm -hmm. is what should the intention be and what and uh discuss the awareness also um let's see is the intention different for different people, or should it always be pretty much the same? Yeah, I think the intention can change day to day or hour to hour. Okay. You know, I think it's okay. in some ways it's up to each person. The intention of yoga, again, is ultimately to still the fluctuations of the mind or, or to be able to identify what causes fluctuations and to be able to set conditions to in some ways control that it's not controlling outside circumstance it's just con being able to control our response correct uh, all right yeah. Uh, yeah and to be able to respond it's not always about controlling but it's about not being um governed always by uh even the information that we're able to feel so even as you grow your body map even as you grow your level of sensitivity and awareness literally um it's you need to couple that with being able to direct your attention and direct your energies because otherwise it's like, okay, great. I feel about, I, now I'm feeling, you know, we have 2 million sense receptors in our fascia. Now I'm feeling all of this stuff. It's awesome. But if it's only taking me for a ride per se, or is, uh, it's what the intention has to do with, well, why, you know, what do you want? What do you want to do? How do you, how do you want to, how do you want to live, essentially? Mm. Um, Christina. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I've been quiet as a mouse over here, just bouncing. You have. <laughs> Come on, you're a yoga. You're Not a yoga. Off, but. <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, yes, of course. Um, yeah, we have a pretty strong belief in yoga. I mean, our company is called Yoga Hub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and more towards uh, the different philosophies, not just the, as you say, the yoga scene, as mm -hmm. in the asanas. But it was very interesting, uh, Katie, um, when you mentioned, I, I loved what you said about how you could feel the body becoming fluid. <clears throat> I mean, you, you said it in, or lubricated, and you said it in such a beautiful way, because you're absolutely right. Um, I was very much against yoga when I first started. I was into everything else, Pilates. Yeah. I was into everything else. And just out of, you know, wanting to support a friend who just opened her yoga studio, I said, okay, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say by the second and third class, I was bitten mm. because uh, I was already practicing meditation. 
And I realized with each asana and it, her style was, her form was Shivananda. So it's mm-hmm. much slower than the mm-hmm. Hatha. And um, it, it became understandable. For me, it was not about the pretzel. Oh my God. The, the pose, the hardest pose was Shavasana, lying on your back and trying yeah. to be a corpse. <laughs> you know, uh, how do you do Really? You know? mm-hmm. so, so it was an eye opener. But when you said the word, how the body becomes lubricated, that's exactly how my body began to feel. And the more and more so where, you know, I uh, do body work and how I've encouraged people to just do the simplest poses Mm -hmm. in yoga, the simplest, um, and hold it. Yep. It was fascinating, the levels of release Mm -hmm. without, I tell them, don't try, just do the levels of release that they'd never seen in their bodies, even since childhood. Mm-hmm. And then learning about uh, another individual, Matthew Sanford. Have you heard of him? I haven't. You mentioned when we spoke before, but yeah. Yes, he was a uh, uh, paraplegic since he was 12 years old. Mm. And he had, and in those days, you know, he was in uh, the, those bed contraptions. I'm sure, Glenn, right. you, know, <laughs> you know, where they're just linked up in that bed for, for you know, years. <laughs> Um, and he had the, the metal uh, uh, posts in his back to mm-hmm. keep his spine mm-hmm. straight. He had those removed mm. because he, uh, by this, uh, by in his 20s, someone introduced him to yoga and he was, he had broken his back twice by then. Mm-hmm. Um, and he even said, just learning the breathing, just learning the simplicity, it got to the point where he could get feeling yeah. where he could never feel before yeah, with intention and awareness. You hit those right on. Mm-hmm. And I mean, what you were talking about brought me back to his book, Waking, where he mm-hmm. told of I'll his story and he finally went in and despite everything, the surgeons and all were telling him he had those metal posts removed. Yeah. And I remember going, and he's a yoga therapist. He has a nonprofit. He ended up having a child, marrying mm-hmm. and having a child and having his yoga studio where he promotes yoga to people, who, not people who are well, but yep. also people who have disabilities like he had. And I say that because I watched him in a class and oh my Lord, he was doing things I never could do yet. Yeah. yeah. And he is still a paraplegic. Yeah. It and was it's, magnificent. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's, yeah, I think the possibilities of what we're able to, um, what we're able to do are, are, are you know, they're, they're mm-hmm. limited, but they're not, there's, there's way more that's changeable in us than I think, uh, mm-hmm. most of us intuit or we've been taught. Yes. Um, and it's, a, in some ways it's really great that, 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 is becoming, that's a common story mm-hmm. in BKS Iyengar and yoga, who's kind of yes. one of the fathers of, of postural yoga and the sense of, of, and therapeutic yoga, yes. you know, also, you know, started as a, as a young boy, very, um, uh, very sick and, mm-hmm. and used yoga as a way of, of strengthening and then, and then onward. Um, but I think, in some ways, it, that that may be a good bridge to talk about the public work that I'm doing because, mm-hmm. again, I think it's in some ways it's it's simply about updating um, our how we think about the body, how we talk about the body, and and I say body, but it's but it's but it's all of it, um, and and again with the fascia, it's like it's it's glistening, it's it's so changeable and you see these strands that just kind of like glide down and then separate so it's like this amazing web that's really you know um it would be like in a in a fantasy movie sort of not in a not in the aliens movie but in you know Mm -hmm. like oh you've just walked through this amazing enchanting forest Mm -hmm. Mm um and so shifting how people a like what people think is possible to yes. feel, I think, is in some ways, because it's literal, right? It's mm-hmm. like, okay, um, and and what they understand about what kinds of movement are 
healthy, um, what kinds of movement are satisfying, the, and getting that out into the public sphere is, um, is important. And actually it's being done, I think, in, in, lots of, in lots of realms by lots of different people. Yes. Um, so mm, it's, it's really beautiful to hear this because um, in my years of body work, the uh, indigenous cultures, they believe like uh, for centuries, decades, they mm-hmm. teach that no, no matter what, it's body wisdom. Mm-hmm. And the body is wise and our mind gets in the way, you know, mm-hmm. our society, our cultures can get in the way of how we perceive, as you say, perceive pain or perceive what we can and cannot do. Um, and, uh, uh, how even, um, the most minor surgery, you're actually cutting through that mm-hmm. web that mm-hmm. you're talking about mm-hmm. and it's reconnecting and he- those healing energies of that web before even the organ that they were trying to help can heal. Right. You right. Know? So it's, it's fascinating yeah. what you're yeah. saying because it, it's, it's hitting me at a very deep core. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right yeah, down into your fascia. Okay. It's the home of the immune system too, you know? Yeah. So it's once, once that's disrupted a little bit, then that it has its effects that way too. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the uh, public space, and we're not just talking about here's a yoga studio on, uh, you know, Third and Main. You right. actually, <laughs> you actually go out into public spaces, and I want you to describe some of the different types of work that you do, and mm-hmm. the purpose of it, and how it's affected people. Sure. Um, so I started. I, there was a storefront actually in the mission in San Francisco where I live um, that became available to use for like a week or something like that. And it's, it's on this great, really lively corner with windows on both sides uh, on a corner. And so I, I decided I wanted to put different movements in the, win- in the storefront. So not of like people walking by and looking at something to consume as far as buy, but just it was on the way to work and back from work every day to have people doing movement that that were personal practices. It wasn't teaching. It wasn't um, rehearsing. Even it wasn't. It certainly wasn't performing. Um, so that that could be a part of the neighborhood for 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 a week. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one thing we did. Part of that was also holding workshops um, and lectures. Uh, with different people talking about how the body influenced uh, their understanding of their work. Um, so, for instance, we had like a NASA robotics who was talking about consegrity and body work as a way of, of changing the way that he was designing robotics. Um, we had someone who talked about public speaking and, and a sense of inner awareness um, and how it affects an audience. Um, Anyway, so that was that was the first kind of project that I did, which was really uh, great and exhausting, but but great. And then uh, and then another thing again was just like, okay, well, how do you bring something into public space so that people are curious about it, so that they have kind of a surprising, hopefully kind of delightful interaction. Um, so. And then we, I was asking the question of like, well, what is it that that can't be denied, right? That's like that I couldn't say, oh, well, you know, I want people to feel the movement of their kidney or something. Uh, and that led me to to deciding to amplify heartbeats into public space. Wait, so, what do you mean by what do you mean amplify heartbeats? Mm-hmm, so we set up four people on a corner in the financial district of San Francisco on Market Street. Um, each connected to a speaker, and we rigged a stethoscope. And then during lunchtime for a few hours, um, for two consecutive days, we just had them sit with the stethoscope, and the speakers were pretty loud. Didn't, it was a little DIY, but for the most part, loud enough to really affect that corner um, and and filled that space with heartbeats, uh, live heartbeats. And in, it was interesting because I... I I thought it was a little bit of a weird idea in some ways. I didn't know how it would go, and I wasn't, 
I was enthused to be working on it, and I believed in it intellectually, but I didn't know what it would feel like to, to be out there doing it. Uh, and it was actually really, really great that the space softened in a way that um, that was surprising. And for lots of people, people slowed down, they stopped, they closed their eyes. Um, a few people like put their hands on their own hearts, a few people touched each other. Um, mm. and, and so, and this is, you know, like busy financial district, like guys with briefcases, you know, women in high heel, you know, all this sort of stuff, those are cliches, but, um, and so, yeah, part of that was just, uh, again, I like the idea of first being aware of something that's happening all the time within us and it's affecting us in a huge level. Um, that we don't usually pay attention to. And then also to be directed to do that by, by listening to someone else's heartbeat, to, to, by listening to someone else's beat as a way of coming into oneself, I, I thought was important in public space. Um, and then I think in some ways it does have to do with the changes that have happened just with technology and the Internet and all of that, that, that the use of public space is different now. Um, you know, it used to be where everyone, uh, you know, from town square and people getting up on soapboxes and all of that. I mean, protests still happen, um, but it's also even where shopping happened or where, you know. And now uh, I think there's something important about bringing, um, bringing these kinds of surprises and interactions with one another on a human level um, reminding people about that in public space because it's it's an opportunity, you know, and cities are getting larger, they're, you know, with world population. There's a lot of people are thinking about cities. They're thinking about how cities are planned. They're thinking about how to make p- cities scaled for people. Um, and so this is just like one tiny drop in the bucket of, um, of bringing that into public discourse and awareness. I know that uh, when obviously working in hospitals, when we would put an ultrasound over a pregnant woman's abdomen and they would hear their baby's heartbeat for the first time, you could see amazing changes. And for me, yeah. from the very from the very first time I used a, steth- a stethoscope and put put it on someone's chest and listened to a heartbeat, to even today. In that one moment, when I start hearing the heartbeat, my whole consciousness changes for a few minutes. My focus goes into another world, uh, and it's it's very interesting. It's serene. It's it's about consciousness. Uh, so many aspects come into your own process at that point. Are you planning on doing that anywhere else? Are you thinking about doing that around the world? Uh, you know, doing it in China or at the Eiffel Tower, or what's your next project? Uh, aside from that, mm-hmm. um, so I am thinking about doing the heartbeat specifically um, in larger scales. Right now, uh, right now I'm working on one within San Francisco and then anywhere else that I'm traveling. Where um, rather than the heartbeats filling up the space for anyone who walks by, I have a um, like four Bluetooth headphones that people can pick up and put on. And then either myself or someone else will be in the space with the stethoscope on. So it's a kind of a differently intimate experience where you, that becomes the soundtrack. Um, and that's kind of as a way of just, it's easy to do. I can go for an hour somewhere and do it. And it's just kind of seeding, seeding that project. Um, I would love to be able to set up, um, I've been thinking about doing something at the ferry building, like from the clock tower. Um, in San Francisco, but also, say, on a college campus where a heartbeat is um, projected into space that way. Um, and I also have the idea of doing a roundtable where people could sit down across from each other and put the stethoscope on and kind of listen to each other's heartbeats. And that could be connected to the Internet so that there's a little switch that says, you know, near the Eiffel Tower or whatever and have a different pod there. But then you could actually listen in real time to heartbeats, you know, across the world. Uh, and 
So those are those are some ideas. Um, That's pretty interesting. I was thinking, okay. you know, how we've had um, people holding hands across the world at one yeah. point, you know, and seeing those images everywhere. I wonder what would happen if we had just a massive heartbeat mm. uh, going on around the world in different places. That's a cool idea. You know, there's so much about the heartbeat that's that's interesting. Like they sync up, you know, the heart rate syncs up and mm -hmm. even physiologically, like listening to a heartbeat has the same um, effect as looking at someone in the eye. Yeah. Yeah. Katie, in, in preparing for this uh, talk, is there anything that we didn't cover that you specifically wanted to mention right now before we get your health tip? Oh, there were things, but I think that's that's probably enough for t for today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I think so because you gave some, as Christina alluded to, you gave some very interesting concepts mm. about yoga and movement and connective tissue and and the the way the future may be. I think there's a possibility that there'll be whole new forms of exercise that yep. are related, you know, more than having a big biceps, having a functional fascia. Definitely. I think there already are actually, Glenn, there's some, there's some really great, you know, I'd recommend Googling it. There's some great work being done. Um, some great podcasts that people can listen to and videos. And there's, we, we kind of just touched on the, on the briefest parts here, but there's a lot of information about different kinds of movement, um, that affects the fascia in different ways. Um, so yeah, people should check that out. I can send some links to you, you guys, and you can put them on. Yeah, I would think in thinking about it, you know, we're looking for all new ways, but then you think about yoga, tai chi, qigong, aren't mm. these ways that, you know, we're starting to see that the evidence of tai chi and qigong and yoga are improving health, both, as you said, the muscular and the skeletal systems and joints and now the fascia, but also the immune system and consciousness and mm. and high blood pressure and everything else. So. Uh, it's great, and I appreciate so many of the things you said. You brought some good Glenn. insights into my mind about how to focus when you're doing uh, one of the poses. Okay, Katie, it's time for a health tip. Okay, so I have two. One is dry brushing, just as a simple thing to do that does invigorate all the fascia. Huh? And the other... Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, I've never interrupted a health tip. All right. But, <laughs> I was but, waiting for Glenn to say wait. <laughs> <laughs> Dry brushing, you mean like brushing your teeth or gua sha or something on the skin or something like that? So there's actually brushes that are meant for brushing our skin. They almost okay. look like horse brushes. Um, okay. And yeah, you, you, you brush the body while it's dry. Um, as a way of invigorating the fascia, getting things moving, rehydrating, and also it circulates the lymph. Um, so it's, it's an easy thing to do. It can take anywhere from like three to five to 10 minutes in the morning. And, um, and it's a way also of kind of, as I was saying, like building the body, uh, map in the brain. Okay. Nice. The other one was similar to that, which was just uh, throughout the day, like notice where you're literally touching anything. So if you're sitting right now, like if you just take a second and feel literally where you're touching the chair or the floor, or whatever it is, when you're standing, feel your feet and your shoes. Like if you do that just throughout the day, even for a few seconds, is another way of um, helping to create grounding in the system and um and over time i think it's actually it will have really big effects on being able to release and relax in some ways mm. seems like that's really about mindfulness isn't it it is although it's, it's quite a physical practice right <clears throat> grateful to our very special guest katie fox a <laughs> yoga instructor and so much more for sharing her <laughs> wisdom and experience and expertise with us i'd like to thank all of my teachers and healers for bringing me on my journey to where i am today to christina and segovia and all of yoga hub and to all of our uh, global audience for staying with us i look forward to getting together again on magical medical tour in another week we'll explore 
another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. Thank you so much, Katie. And until Thank our you. next meeting, yes, <laughs> we appreciate everything that you've done for us today. And I look forward to listening to this again uh, to get more of the deep wisdom that you talked about. I wish you all optimal health. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie, for gifting us with uh, our global audience is going to love this one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's so fun to talk with you both. And I did bounce pretty high, too. (laughs) Very good. (laughs) And of course, thank you so much, Dr. Glenn Woolman, for another great show. I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us on this new platform of education and information. We're grateful for your continuous support, and we look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. You can connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman through his website, glennwoolman.com, where you can learn about his metaphor, Square Breath, or follow him on Facebook, The Medical Guide. You can connect with Katie Fox through her websites, katiefoxyoga.com, wearemovement.org, heartsoundscape.com. And of course, all these are listed on our website, including her Twitter and Facebook. So we hope that this moment on YHTV has supported you or a loved one in some way. And we invite you to take a moment to like us or subscribe to our YouTube channel. This will help broaden the messages to others out there. We're always grateful for any feedback, comments, and suggestions. Please give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. Until next time, namaste. know that the uh, systems of sound and hearing uh, start in the uterus very early uh, Mm -hmm. and we learn about sound through vibration and one of the interesting things that I did in my research is you know there's the certain frequency of sounds that we hear in the human ear and then there's sounds that are below that frequency and above that frequency and within the realms of medicine and healing medicine Western medicine uses the sounds that are above the hearing sounds.